Hey there, podcast listeners. It's Joel Furchus. For the last 15 weeks, the Mentionables have been doing a video series on YouTube answering 15 questions that supposedly no Christian can answer. This YouTube series has included contributions from myself, Tyler Vella, Mark Lambert, who has also participated in the Mentionable Project, and Caleb Johnston, who has been featured on the podcast recently. The series was fun, and it ran a while, and we thought that it would be a good project, but then I realized that there are some of you out there that only listen to audio. I know you feel like freaks, but quite honestly, I only ever listen to audio, too, when I'm absorbing information. If you go over to YouTube, you can check them out, but in the meantime, we're converting them all to podcast episodes. This is the first episode. Again, the voices you hear will be of myself, Tyler Vella, Mark Lambert, and Caleb Johnston. Enjoy the first question in the series of questions no Christian can answer. Okay, we are live. Greetings, everybody. You're watching Mentionables TV. I'm Joel Furchis, and we are the Mentionables. Today is the first in our Questions No Christian Can Answer series. But here's the twist. We're the Christians, and we answer the questions. Here's the first question. This comes from the Non Sequitur YouTube channel. If God is going to be posited for an explanation for human existence, then by what mechanisms, meaning by what activities and interactions that are organized in such a way that produced humans, did God use? And by what means could we discover those mechanisms? Okay, so I'm not exactly sure what's meant by this question. I think the obvious answer is science. Duh. Um, however, the question seems to go a little bit further by asking exactly what was used and how. I think this is either a question that's geared towards science-denying Christians, or is a question to flip around the limits of science and use it in reverse as a gotcha. Um, scientists have been unable to come up with any working and probable models of a biogenesis, or any models of the solar system that extend beyond the first moments of the Big Bang. Christianity makes sense of this limit without immediately falling into a I don't know, so it must have been God mentality. In other words, in Christianity we would expect some separation in our knowledge and that of the Creator, as opposed to what we would be able to determine about other models of the origin life, such as aliens did it, um, as Richard Dawkins likes to uh, throw out there. Anywho, I think that uh, if this question is sincere, then obviously science is the pursuit that we have to go with to understand what we can about creation. But Christianity does explain the limits that we'd, we would expect to run into. This first question is kind of strange, actually. I thought, well, okay. Um, if, if you were to come to me and ask, you know, I, 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 I know that we are supposed to believe that God created the world, but how did he do it? Right? If you're struggling with belief because you don't know how it is that God created the world, here is my answer to the question of how did God do it? What mechanism did he use and how can we identify that mechanism? My answer is, I don't know. And I don't care. And that might sound a little glib. I'm not trying to be. But here's the thing. Though it's not stated in this question, kind of the assumption that is built in here is this implication that if you don't know how something works or how it came to be, then you should not believe it. But we don't actually use that way of thinking anywhere else in our life. right? That is what's called an argument from ignorance. You don't know, therefore you shouldn't believe. Well, hold on, just because you don't know doesn't mean it's not true. So you have to look at other things to see whether or not there is justification for the belief, even if you don't have this knowledge over here. 
And so the assumption that's being made is that if you don't know how something came to be, then you shouldn't believe that it is true. But stop and think about if we were to use that reasoning in other areas of life. Right? Do you understand internal combustion? Some of you probably do. You're probably mechanics, and it just makes sense to you. Right? I pop the hood. I have no idea what I'm looking at. I mean, I can kind of identify that's the battery. Right? I think that's the alternator over there. You know, Here's where I check the oil. That's about it. I don't understand what's going on in there or why it works or how it works. Or as I'm driving down the street and that computer, computer, I don't know how that works, but it's maintaining and controlling everything to make sure it's all working properly. I don't understand how all that works. Does that mean I shouldn't drive a car? Well, of course not. Right? And, and hey, if you're flown in a plane, do you understand the laws of aerodynamics and all the principles that work in there to make that plane lift and fly and keep you safe? No, I, I don't understand how that works. So should I just not fly planes? Well, that doesn't make sense either. See, there's all kinds of things where we don't know the how. We don't know the mechanism. But that doesn't mean we're not justified in trusting in, believing in, uh, that something is the case. Right? Long before people understood planetary rotation and orbiting the sun and how all that works, we still knew the sun came up in the east, it set in the west. Well, okay, so if you don't understand about planetary rotation, should you just not believe the sun is coming up in the east? No, you have good reason to believe the sun is coming up in the east, because look, there it is. And so just because you don't understand the mechanism is not a reason to doubt the conclusion. You, you could have entirely other reasons to believe that something is true. Likewise, when it comes to God, when it comes to believing that God created the universe, if you have good reason to believe there is a creator, and you look over here, there is a creation. How did this creator make this creation come about? I don't know. But I have good reason to believe there's a creation. I have good reason to believe there's a world and it's there and I live in it. And then I have good reason to believe there's a creator, that there's a God that exists that made the world. How did he do it? I don't know. It'd be really cool to know. right? I'm naturally a curious person. I want to know how things work. I'm the kind of kid that would just take things apart to figure out how they work. I usually didn't figure out how they worked and I couldn't put them back together again. But that's besides the point. It's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to seek knowledge, wanting to seek information. However, don't base what you determine to be true based on your curiosity not being satisfied. Rather, you look at what you actually do have, and does that reach the conclusion? We have reason to believe there's a creator. We know there's a creation. We live in it. We're part of it. Okay, so we know there's a creator. We know there's a creation. How did he do it? You know, even if that's not satisfied. You're still justified in accepting the evidence for the creator and the creation. This video appears to be asking a question that capitalizes on this trumped up conflict between Christianity and science. Imagine, for instance, that a parent was asked a question by their child, why does the sun shine? So the parent gives this answer. They say that, well, the sun shines because of a thermonuclear reaction in its core that rips the electron off of the hydrogen molecule, creating a photon that is then r rushes towards the surface of the sun, at which point it's released and travels through space at the speed of light, reaching Earth eight minutes later. That's why the sun shines. Or the parent could give a different answer. They could say that, well, the sun shines to give us light and to warm the earth and to give the plants food so that it feeds the earth. That's why the sun shines. Now, the first answer that the parent gave was a how answer. It described how the sun shined. The second answer was actually an answer to the child's question, why does the sun shine? The second answer is by nature, a theological answer, because it assigns purpose to the sun. It assigns meaning to the sun. It designs design to the sun's place in nature. And if you're going to have purpose, design, and meaning, you're going to have a purposer, a designer. So it assumes the existence of God, even if incidentally. So the question that he asks about mechanics, 
that's not a theological question. Theology doesn't tell you the mechanics behind something. It tells you the why. Assume, for instance, that he asked a philosopher, what's the philosophical mechanics behind the beginning of humanity? The philosopher couldn't tell you that because it's not a philosophical question. A philosopher could tell you the uh, existential implications behind the existence of man or the beginning of man, but there's no philosophical answer to the mechanics behind the beginning of man. Or if he were to ask, say, a psychologist, what's the psychological origins or mechanics uh, behind the beginning of man? That's not a psychology question, so there is no psychological answer. The psychologist could tell you the reason that he, the motivation for w asking the question, but there's no psychological answer to that question. Even so, there's no theological answer to the question of the mechanics behind the beginning of man. Theology could tell you man's purpose, man's uh, association or relationship with God. That's the purpose of theology. Theology doesn't tell us mechanics. Science tells us mechanics. This seems to operate on, off of this idea that all truth is scientific truth. If a truth can't be arrived at through the means of science, then it's not true. Uh, this idea, this scientism, as it's been called, sort of obviates f philosophy altogether, or theology, because since philosophy doesn't operate off of physical mechanics, then it can't be true through scientific means. So the idea that science is uh, all that exists, or the only way of arriving at truth, is a philosophical idea. They arrived at that idea through philosophy, not through science. There's no scientific uh, way of determining that science is the only way to find truth. That's just an assumption that they start off with. So you ask a, philo or a scientific question of theology, then you've, by asking a, uh, the wrong question to the wrong uh, study, you've tricked this idea into notion that it can't be true because it can't describe the mechanics. Not so. All right. So this is a question that many people have called a Pratt. That is, it's a point refuted a thousand times. It's the kind of question that sounds good in-house to people who think like you, and so it keeps getting repeated by those who aren't really able to consider answers from outside of their own worldview. So how has this question been refuted repeatedly? Well, primarily in two different ways. First, the objection proposes a false standard for epistemic warrant. That is, it sets up a standard for reasonable belief that we don't hold in any other analogous area of study. So it's actually obscenely easy to dispel this first take on the argument. In this case, the objection seems to assume that even if we grant that God exists, we still can't know that God exists because we can't know what mechanisms God used to produce humanity or the cosmos or whatever they want to fill in. And the atheist thinks that this is some insurmountable objection. Remember, these are ones that Christians can't answer. The simple answer is that we don't need to know what mechanism God used to bring about humanity or the cosmos to know that God did, in fact, bring about humanity or the cosmos. We don't need to hold this bizarre notion that what we must, uh, what we must know means that we have to know the cause that brought about the effect to, uh, to know that the cause brought about the effect. Kind of redundant, but let me explain. I don't need to know how Henry Ford came up with or produced the first Model A to know that he did it. This fact about epistemic warrant is nearly universally recognized, and yet for some reason when atheists come to the question of God, reason and logic just fly out the window, and they start claiming that unless we know how we know, that we can't know anything at all. Or an even softer claim, if we can't know how something came to be by a cause, we can't even have warranted belief that something came to be by that cause which is just 
demonstrably nonsensical on any even basic understanding of epistemology. So uh, that's one major problem with, the, with this first objection. But there's a second, more substantial objection. This question from the skeptic is in the form of what's called an internal critique. Now, those of you who are familiar with my work in other areas know that I think internal critiques are one of the most often used and abused and misunderstood kinds of arguments posed against, against Christianity by atheists. So, an internal critique is a kind of argument that's in the for the sake of argument type of category. They're an informal version of a, a reductio ad absurdum or a reduction to the absurd where they assume something is true or a position is true in order to show that its truth entails a falsity, which would be an absurdity. It would make it false. The idea is that if we assume the truth of a position and it has certain internal contradictions or tensions that lead to absurd conclusions, we ought to reject it. Now, here's why if we grant the biblical notion of God and creation, where God spoke and the cosmos leapt into existence, and if God is a supernatural entity, then we have good reason to think that God did not use natural mechanisms. Mechanisms are just a fancy way and kind of diversionary tactic for the atheist and the naturalist to sneak in naturalistic assumptions in through the back door. It's like the problem pointed out above, but in this case, it's introducing assumptions that are not part of the biblical worldview to try to evaluate the biblical worldview. And that's all fine and well, but for an internal critique to work, the atheist cannot bring external assumptions in as a requirement. And so when the atheist brings in these external assumptions of the requirement of a natural mechanistic process, they undo their own internal critique. This means that they set it up as an internal criticism, but actually have to smuggle in question-begging assumptions into the question to make it even sound palatable to their atheistic audience. It's a structural shifting of the goalposts. It makes the argument invalid. So the simple answer for the internal critique is that we reject that God needed to or did use any naturalistic mechanisms. Now, he could have, but it's not required. And if it's not required, then I don't need to know that to have a reasonable belief that God still is the best explanation for the creation of the cosmos or of humanity. Now, without going into the different type of causes, couldn't the atheist then just say that we're begging the question of God if we introduce him as an explanation for the cosmos and humanity without these mechanisms? Not at all. Like these questions often come down to, the question becomes, what makes an explanation a good explanation? Well, for those of you who listened to my debate with Ben Watkins at this year's Mentionable Conference, you'll know we spent a lot of time covering what makes a good explanation. Things like explanatory scope, explanatory power, simplicity, low levels to no levels of ad hocness, internal inconsist inconsistencies, uh, well, sorry, internal consistencies, and a potential transcendental necessity. Notice in there was not the metric of knowing what material or natural mechanisms were used. Even without knowing what mechanism God used, if he used any at all, God could still drastically outpace any alternative explanation in these actual explanatory evaluatory metrics. And as for myself, and I think what most Christians would argue, he does just that. Thanks for watching Mentionables TV. Stay tuned next week when we answer the second question, which deals with metaphorical and literary interpretations of the scripture. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching.